and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, our first presentation, as I mentioned, is from Dr. Alana Rosenthal, who is uh, uh, a professor at the uh, University uh, of Maryland, and she is going to give us a uh, overview of uh, these uh, issues. There you are. Hi, welcome, Alana. And I'm going to turn it over to you. You can share your screen, and we will get started. Thank you so much, Dr. Sag. Um, all right. Um, thank you, Dr. Sag, and thank you to IAS USA for having me today to talk about sex, drugs, and ART, addressing substance use in people with HIV. Here are my financial relationships with ineligible companies. So the learning objectives for today are going to be to learn how to screen for substance use disorder in a primarily HIV-related practice, describe the benefits of medication for opioid use disorder for people with HIV, and initiate and maintain buprenorphine for treatment of opioid use disorder. First, some definitions. Substance use or substance misuse refers to non-prescribed use of a substance. Dependence refers to physiologic reliance on a substance, which may lead to tolerance and withdrawal. And substance use disorder refers to substance dependence with significant problems associated with ongoing substance use. So for some background, if anyone's wondering why we're talking about substance use disorder at an HIV conference, people with HIV have higher rates of substance use than the general population. And substance use may contribute to higher rates of risk-taking behaviors, including risky sexual behaviors, injection drug use, and sharing of injecting equipment. Further, active substance use is associated with lower rates of engagement across the HIV care continuum and lower rates of HIV viral load suppression. So as HIV providers, substance use really impacts all of us and our patient care uh, potential. The first step to addressing substance use disorder is identifying it. The USPSTF now recommends screening for unhealthy drug use in all adults age 18 and older. How do we do this? Simply asking the question, how many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or used a prescription medication for non-medical reasons has been shown to be 100% sensitive and 73.5% specific for the detection of a drug use disorder. I personally prefer not to reference legality as it may make patients less comfortable disclosing use behavior. So I generally ask if patients have used a prescription drug for non-medical reasons or a non-prescribed drug for recreational purposes. For people who answer yes to any of these questions, there are several further screening options that can be found through the NIDA website. I would recommend checking out the Tobacco, Alcohol, Prescription Medication, and Other Substance Use Tool, TAPS, which can be found at nida.nih.gov slash TAPS2. That URL will take you to a website that actually helps you to administer the TAPS. First, you'll be asked if you're a patient or clinician and can click the I am the clinician. You will then be prompted with a series of questions to ask the patient. So again, this is meant to be used during clinic. Here's an example of one question where they ask, in the past 12 months, how often have you used any drugs, including marijuana, cocaine or crack, heroin, methamphetamine, hallucinogens, ecstasy, or MDMA? If the patient responds affirmative for drug use for any time interval, then they ask follow-up questions. For instance, here it asks, in the past three months, did you use heroin? And if the patient responds yes, then it will follow up. In the past three months, have you tried to and failed to control, cut down, or stop using heroin? In the past three months, has anyone expressed concern about your use of heroin? I like this tool because it really walks you through the screening process and can easily be completed online during a patient visit. The other nice feature is that at the completion of the survey, it will give you an assessment of the patient's risk level and suggested interventions. In the case of this mock patient, he was thought to be high risk for opioid use disorder. And it was suggested, among other things, that the diagnosis was con be confirmed using the DSM-5 opioid use disorder criteria, along with other suggestions, including consider prescribing medication to treat opioid use disorder and testing for hepatitis C and HIV infection. As recommended in the TAPS, the definitive diagnosis of a substance use disorder occurs when a patient meets DSM-5 criteria. To meet criteria for substance use disorder, a person must meet two or more of the following criteria within 12 months, taking increasing amounts of the drug, persistent desire or unsuccessful efforts to cut down, 
time spent obtaining, using, or recovering from drug use, craving, drug use preventing fulfilling of obligations, social or interpersonal problems as a result of drug use, giving up important activities due to drug use, um, putting oneself in physically harmful situations, physical or psychological problems due to drug use, tolerance, and withdrawal. The important thing to understand is that DSM-5 criteria for substance use disorder identify a problematic pattern of substance use leading to clinically significant impairment or distress in addition to physiologic dependence. This is not just taking a drug a couple times at a party, but otherwise going about your life as usual. This is also not your grandma forgetting to um, replace her fentanyl patch and feeling some withdrawal symptoms. This is talking about physiologic dependence with problematic psychosocial behaviors as a result of drug use. Diagnosing opioid use disorder is particularly important because it's increasingly a problem in the United States and we have evidence-based medications to treat opioid use disorder that are dramatically underutilized. Between 2020 to 2021, there were over 100,000 drug overdose deaths, over 75,000 of which were due to opioids. This is double the number of deaths at the peak of the HIV epidemic in 1995. Clearly, this is a massive problem in our country and one that disproportionately impacts our patients with HIV, as well as puts individuals at risk for HIV acquisition. The good news is that there are three FDA-approved therapies to treat opioid use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Methadone and buprenorphine are both opioid agonists with methadone fully binding to the mu opioid receptor and buprenorphine partially binding. You may be more familiar with buprenorphine using its brand name, named Suboxone. Naltrexone differs somewhat in that it's an antagonist of the opioid receptor. Today, we'll mainly be talking about the opioid agonist. So one of the most important aspects of medication for opioid use disorder is that it decreases drug use frequency and injecting drug use. While patients on medication for opioid use disorder do not always achieve abstinence, they almost always have a significant decline in substance use frequency. Here you can see that in people who inject drugs initiating methadone, the percentage who injected drugs steadily decreased over the course of treatment. However, in those who stopped methadone maintenance, there was a steady return to injecting drug use over time. Further, medication for opioid use disorder reduces mortality. Here, data from a study in Massachusetts evaluated mortality as seen on the y-axis in patients with a recent non-fatal overdose. Patients not on medication for opioid use disorder had the highest rates of mortality, seen here, while engagement in medication for opioid use disorder was significantly associated with decreased mortality for a year after overdose. Engagement in medication for opioid use disorder is also associated with improved outcomes in people living with HIV, including improved uptake, adherence, and retention to ART, as well as higher likelihood of viral suppression. This graph represents a multi-center study of 10 sites providing combined HIV and buprenorphine treatment for patients with HIV and opioid use disorder. Here we can see comparisons for people treated with buprenorphine for less than three quarters of the year in gray, compared to people on buprenorphine for three or four quarters in black. Of subjects not on ART at baseline, patients prescribed buprenorphine for three or more quarters were significantly more likely to initiate ART on the left, and significantly more likely to achieve HIV viral suppression on the right. Lastly, we can see that not only engaging in medication for opioid use disorder, but co-location of HIV and opioid use disorder treatment can further confer benefits on this population. In a study of 93 HIV infected patients with opioid use disorder, randomized to receive co-located buprenorphine or to uh, buprenorphine co-located with their HIV care, or receive HIV care at one site and case management and referral to an opioid treatment program, the patients on the co-located buprenorphine arm had improved uptake of medication for opioid use disorder, fewer opiate positive urine drug screens, and improved HIV primary care visit adherence. Believe me, if you are prescribing their buprenorphine, patients are going to show up for their ART visits as well. These data reinforce that not only should people with HIV and opioid use disorder be treated with medication for opioid use disorder, but that we as HIV providers should be the ones prescribing medication for opioid use disorder as part of their comprehensive HIV care. And the good news is that now we all can. Thanks to the MAT Act of 2023, all practitioners who have a current DEA registration may prescribe buprenorphine for opioid use disorder 
there is no longer a requirement for a special X waiver. So today, I want to provide you with some brief background that will help you to start prescribing buprenorphine in your own HIV practices. Some major features of buprenorphine that are important to understand. Buprenorphine is a semi-synthetic partial agonist at the mu opioid receptor. It causes very minimal respiratory suppression and no respiratory arrest when used as prescribed. This is why we're allowed to prescribe buprenorphine in reg regular outpatient settings. It's fairly safe. The one thing to be cautioned about is that it can result in significant respiratory depression when combined with high enough doses of alcohol or benzodiazepines. Buprenorphine has a half-life of about 24 to 36 hours, meaning patients get fairly steady opioid agonism throughout the day. This is in contrast to heroin, which has a very short half-life. This leads to frequent cycles of use and withdrawal that interfere with normal activity and functioning. Perhaps the most notable feature of buprenorphine is the high affinity to the mu receptor. It binds really tightly to that receptor. This results in the blocking of other opioids, meaning that when a patient is taking buprenorphine, if they use heroin on top of it, they may not feel the heroin or not feel it as much. It also can result in displacement of other opioids, meaning that if a patient has recently taken heroin and then takes buprenorphine on top of that, the buprenorphine may knock the heroin off of the opioid receptor and replace it. Because buprenorphine is only a partial agonist compared to heroin, which is a full agonist of the opioid receptor, this can result in the patient going into rapid withdrawal, referred to as precipitated withdrawal. Buprenorphine comes in several formulations. In this very busy table here, you can see information about available buprenorphine formulations, their doses, route of administration, and equivalency dosing. We're not going to read through every cell, but I want to convey a few main points. First, buprenorphine can come in combination with naloxone or as a monoproduct, meaning buprenorphine alone. Naloxone is not meant to be an active agent, but rather is meant to deter injection of buprenorphine. When administered sublingually as prescribed, naloxone is not absorbed, it doesn't have an effect. But when injected, naloxone will cause withdrawal. Buprenorphine can be administered sublingually, that's mainly what we're seeing people prescribe, but it's also available in an injection. Um, and injectable formulations can be given weekly or monthly depending on the dose and the, the brand. The sublingual formulations can be, come in a brand, Suboxone, uh, there are also many generic formulations. And lastly, sublingual formulations can come in tablets or in films. When considering starting buprenorphine, it's important to understand the goals of treatment. And for me, these are to relieve withdrawal, reduce cravings, improve mood, energy, and executive function, and reduce harm by decreasing opioid overdose, decreasing opioid use frequency, increasing patients' control over the parameters of their substance use, decreasing infectious disease transmission, and improving patient care engagement. These things are all evidence-based. You may have noticed that I didn't say abstinence, and that's because abstinence is an excellent outcome if possible, but it's not the only metric of successful treatment. Not everyone will achieve abstinence on medication for opioid use disorder, and that's okay, because they can still achieve significant improvements in quality of life, life function, and reduction in the harms associated with drug use. In the same way, we may prescribe insulin to a diabetic patient in the hopes of achieving a hemoglobin A1C of seven, less than 7%, we would still applaud a hemoglobin A1C reduction from 14% to 9%. So when do we initiate buprenorphine in a patient with opioid use disorder? The answer is as soon as the patient is interested with a few parameters. Because of the strong affinity buprenorphine has for the opioid receptor, we must wait to initiate until the patient is in mild to moderate withdrawal at the time of initiation. This can be assessed using the CAL scale and targeting a score of six or greater. Um, initiating buprenorphine in the fentanyl era can be a bit trickier because fentanyl is so lipophilic and sticks around for a while. So some people recommend waiting until patients who use fentanyl have a CAL score of even up to 13 to 15. In general, patients will be in sufficient withdrawal when they abstain from opioid use for 8 to 12 hours when they use short-acting opioids, 24 hours when they use sustained release opioids, 36 hours when they use methadone, and maybe longer for fentanyl. It's important to note, though, that patients are usually pretty good at assessing how long it will take them to go into sufficient withdrawal, so it's worth a conversation with them to discuss as well. 
When inducing buprenorphine, there are various strategies, but the most standard is to start low and titrate up until the patient finds a sufficient dose. On the first day, your induction day, you should give the patient a first dose of two to four milligrams sublingual buprenorphine. Generally, the easiest way to do this um, is to just cut an eight milligram strip in a quarter or half. The dose should be increased every two to four, sorry, two to four milligrams every one to three hours as needed, though this interval is kind of flexible per patient preference. The maximum dose on day one should be 12 milligrams. On day two, the patient should start at the maximum dose from the previous day. So if they were at eight the previous day, they can start at eight and increase by two to four milligrams as needed with a maximum dose of 16 milligrams. When doing this as an outpatient, it's often easiest to send a first prescription for 16 milligrams per day for seven days. That way you don't uh, get have a risk of them um, running out if they get to the maximum dose of 16 milligrams. I like to see patients within a week because sometimes they need to go even higher than that. And so I prefer to titrate up as quickly as possible. It's also important to counsel patients on how to administer buprenorphine to ensure the best outcomes. First, it's good to make sure they understand that this medication is sublingual, so they should place it under their tongue. The medicine only works if it's absorbed, so make sure patients know not to swallow it. I have been burned by this before. It's also important to understand that buprenorphine will take several minutes to dissolve and tablets may take longer than films, so they need to be patient. You may also wanna warn them that the medication often tastes bad. If there's still a bad taste in your mouth, the medication may not be completely absorbed, and so they need to tough it out as much as possible, and most importantly, resist the inclination to wash the bad taste away, because they may be washing away the medication. In fact, we recommend that patients not smoke or drink five to 10 minutes before or after their dose is taken. You can have patients complete inductions in your office or at home, but I would strongly, strongly recommend home inductions. When I started prescribing buprenorphine, we had all the patients induce in person and they had to come in and withdraw. As you can imagine, they felt terrible. And to be honest, a lot of people never made it to us to start. Home inductions are very much standard of care and allow patients to start on their own terms to be in withdrawal in a space that's more comfortable for them. And it decreases the likelihood that someone's gonna vomit in your waiting room. There are various resources you can give to patients to help make sure they're comfortable inducing at home. This worksheet on the left is from a JGEM article in 2009 that originally described and supported home induction. And a checklist on the right is from ASAM. Both of these documents help patients to identify when they're in sufficient withdrawal and provide guidance on dose titration. It's important to counsel patients on how to administer, oh, sorry. Um, as I said, I generally prescribe a seven day prescription of 16 milligrams per day and follow up with patients after a week. At follow-up visits, I ask patients about their dose, how much buprenorphine did they take each day, when was their last dose, how their symptoms are, any persistent withdrawal symptoms, any cravings, and about drug use frequency and triggers. For the drug use questions, I assume that there is ongoing use, and so rather than frame questions as, you didn't use heroin this week, did you, or did you use any heroin, I say, how many times did you use? It's important to understand that most, most patients won't be abstinent immediately, but most will have reduced their use frequency. So I'd like to congratulate patients on reduced use rather than focus on failure to achieve abstinence. For patients who feel great and deny use, we stick with the dose they're on. However, for those who have ongoing withdrawal symptoms, persistent cravings, ongoing substance use, I discuss a potential dose increase with the target dose of 12 to 24 milligrams. I generally don't like to increase by more than eight milligrams a week, and most insurances require prior, prior authorizations for doses above 24 milligrams, but it's good to understand the restrictions in your state. I do have some patients, several patients actually, who require doses as high as 32 milligrams, and I do see benefit in those patients with elevating that dose, especially in the era of fentanyl. Generally, if a patient cannot be sufficiently controlled on 32 milligrams, then I consider referral to methadone where they can be tra treated with much higher equivalent doses, but ultimately it's up to the patients. In terms of dose frequency, the FDA prescribing information suggests daily dosing. However, I'd say the majority of patients I see find that the effect wears off before 24 hours. So many patients prefer or benefit from divided doses. For instance, a patient on 24 milligrams could take 12 milligrams BID or eight milligrams TID. 
In terms of dose and dosing frequency, it can be helpful to ask patients what has worked for them in the past. Even patients who have never been formally prescribed buprenorphine have often taken it on the street to help with withdrawal. Some even have themselves on a stable regimen of bup that they're purchasing on the street. So they can provide some important input and insight into what may work for them. Okay, so now we're gonna do an audience question. And this is about patient Mr. C, who's a 56 year old man with opioid disorder. He has been using heroin for 30 years, most recently about three to five times a day. Last week, he was initiated on buprenorphine naloxone and titrated up to a dose of 16 milligrams per day. Today at clinic, he reports feeling okay, but still having some nausea, rhinorrhea, and mild cravings. He states he has not used any heroin or other opiates since starting bup last week and reports taking his medication every day. You collect a urine drug screen as part of your standard practice, and this is what the results are. Negative for bup and norbup, positive for morphine and fentanyl. How do you explain the negative buprenorphine? A, not taking medication, possibly diverting. B, took more than prescribed and ran out early. C, medication lost or stolen. D, improper administration. Or E, laboratory error. Okay, so looking at the results, 51% um, said not taking medication, possibly diverting. 25% said took more than prescribed and ran out early. 0% said medication lost or stolen. 25% said improper administration. And 0% said laboratory error. Okay, so let's talk about urine drug screens. Urine drug screens are a tool to help guide treatment. The goal is not to catch a patient in a lie. When getting urine drug screens for buprenorphine, you're looking for both buprenorphine and its breakdown product, norbuprenorphine. In a patient who recently took buprenorphine, you should see both bup and norbup in the urine. The norbup means that the bup was broken down inside of the body. If there's buprenorphine but no norbup, this means that likely the bup went into the urine cup but did not travel through the patient's body to get there. This is colloquially referred to as a dipping, as in the patient dipped a piece of their bup in the urine so it would be positive. No bup and no nor bup means the patient did not take bup for the last 24 to 48 hours, as is the case with the patient we just discussed. So why would someone have a negative urine bup? These are all things that I've seen, okay? The dose can be inadequate and the patient ran out early. Um, medication is lost or stolen, they're not taking or diverting the medication, they have improper administration, or they have laboratory error. I generally give patients the benefit of the doubt in the beginning. Patients are often nervous that they're going to get in trouble and may not feel comfortable telling the truth about ongoing use or taking a higher dose than was prescribed. With establishing rapport, trust, and a recognition that you're working towards the same goal, patients often become more forthcoming. And in my experience, if patients are not taking bup at all, it becomes clear pretty quickly. Um, but I would say in my experience, the most common thing that's happening in the beginning is that the dose that patients are given is not enough. And so because they have the medication in hand, they take more than it was initially prescribed and they run out early. So this is an important conversation to have with patients. So what if you see positive opiates, morphine, fentanyl, et cetera? This means that there are opioids in the urine drug screen, indicating the patient has some ongoing use. However, urine drug screens do not tell the whole story. They don't tell us about use frequency. And as I've said, many patients reduce use without completely abstaining. My patients often go from injecting five times a day to two to three times a week. This is a huge victory. However, it's not gonna be represented in the urine drug screen. If there are opioids in the urine, these aren't patients who are failing treatment, they're patients who may benefit from a higher dose. It's also important to be aware that fentanyl may be unintentionally present in non-opioids. So it's important to notify patients when you find fentanyl in their urine for their own safety. Unfortunately, most heroin on the East Coast these days is predominantly fentanyl. For patients with positive cocaine or methamphetamine, this is definitely a problem that should be discussed. However, it's important to remember that buprenorphine does not treat stimulant use disorder. Therefore, I don't consider presence of non-opioid drugs to imply that the buprenorphine is not working. 
And for patients with benzodiazepine or alcohol on drug screens, make sure to counsel regarding increased risk for respiratory depression or overdose. Taking benzos or alcohol is not a reason to withhold buke because the risk of respiratory depression in conjunction with heroin or fentanyl is even greater. Now to address some specific considerations for people with HIV and substance use. And we'll start again with an audience question. So Mr. P is a 42-year-old man with HIV and opioid use disorder. He presents to your clinic and is found to have a CD4 of 320 and an HIV viral load of 35,000. He also injects heroin or fentanyl four to five times per week. He's not on any medications, but he is interested in starting ART. When would you feel comfortable starting ART in this patient? A, when he's abstinent for three months, B, when he's on MOUD and abstinent, C, when he's on MOUD even if ongoing substance use, or D, it's okay to start ART now. Okay, so 1% said abstinent for three months, 0% said um, on MOUD and abstinent, 17% said on MOUD, and 81% said okay to start now. That's great. So when should we initiate ART in people with substance use? According to the ART guidelines, which you guys have clearly read, ongoing substance use is not a contraindication to ART. People who use substances can achieve and maintain viral suppression. And while it is recommended that all patients are offered evidence-based substance use disorder pharmacotherapy as part of comprehensive HIV care, treatment of substance use disorder is not a prerequisite for treating HIV. I generally ask a patient if and when they feel ready, as I found that they're much better than I am at assessing their ability to adhere to treatment. When thinking about ART selection for people with substance use disorder, the guidelines recommend selection of ART regimens taking into account potential adherence barriers, comorbidities, potential drug interactions, and possible adverse events associated with medications. So preferred ART regimens include one daily dosing of a single tablet, high barriers to resistance, low hepatotoxicity, and low potential for drug-drug interactions, which is really consistent with how we select ART for almost all of our patients. In terms of drug interactions between ART and MOUD, the main thing to be aware of is that methadone and buprenorphine have a potential interaction with CYP inhibitors and inducers. Naltrexone has no significant interactions. Also important to keep in mind that heroin and fentanyl are gonna have similar drug interactions with CYP inhibitors and inducers as methadone and buprenorphine do. Um, if you don't have these memorized off the top of your head, some relevant CYP inhibitors and inducers in the NNRTI class include efavirenz, etravirine, and nevirapine. In the PI class include boosted adazanavir, boosted darunavir, and boosted lopinavir. And in the NC class include boosted elvitegravir. Really of that list, the main thing that you're probably using in your day-to-day -day clinical practice is boosted darunavir. And if you look at the drug interaction between boosted darunavir and buprenorphine and methadone in the Liverpool HIV um, database, what you can see is that this interaction is based on theoretical considerations that boosted darunavir may increase buprenorphine or norbuprenorphine or methadone con uh, plasma con concentrations. However, it's not recommended to adjust the dose of bup or methadone in advance. It's just good to know in these patients to counsel them, if they're feeling more sleepy or more effects of their methadone or buprenorphine to let you know those doses can easily be adjusted. And it's also good to know in general in these patients as you're adding new medications to just let you know if they notice a difference in the effect of their methadone or buprenorphine. So I know we just kind of skimmed the surface of what's important and how to treat substance use disorder. However, there are a lot of great resources out there. Um, PCSS, the Provider Clinical Support System, has a myriad of resources to help providers understand how to treat opioid use disorder, specifically with medications. And if you are in the DC or Maryland area, the University of Maryland has two great resources, the Maryland Addiction Consult Service and the District Addiction Consult Service, where there's a free hotline that you can call and talk to an addiction specialist at any time um, to get advice on how to manage a specific patient. Lastly, as Dr. Sag mentioned, um, IAS USA has a DEA CMA Resource Center and is currently conducting a six um, series webinar specifically focused on substance use disorder. So I highly recommend you check that out as well.
And lastly, some suggested readings. And thank you for listening. Um, now we'll move into the question section. Alana, that was fabulous. What a great overview, very clear on what to do, the issue of the problem. We're, we're going to all be using this uh, in our practices now. So this is just a wonderful uh, uh, prompt to all of us. Before we get into the Q&A itself, I just had one quick question, and that is uh, the importance, emphasizing the importance of giving patients and maybe some family members naloxone. Can you comment on that pretty quickly? Absolutely. Um, I think what I unfortunately didn't have time to touch on is the concept of harm reduction, which is the idea that we can reduce the harms associated with drug use, even in patients who are unable, unwilling, or not ready to abstain from drug use, um, whether or not they want to be on medication. And so some really critical ways that we can reduce harm are first and foremost dispensing naloxone to reverse opioid overdose and prevent death in our patients. Um, I recommend that as providers, everyone carry around your own naloxone. I have used mine many times, um, but also that all patients and all um, family members have access to naloxone as well if they're opioid using. Um, the other you know, resources that should be available to patients include um, sterile syringes and injecting equipment, which as we know as HIV providers are critical to prevent transmission of infectious diseases in, in people who use drugs. And naloxone is now available over the counter. Is that accurate? That's what I've heard. I, I think it may be easier to come by in some places than others, but yeah, yes. so it's just so important. And uh, thank you for that. So we got a lot of questions. I'm going to go through them uh, with quick questions, quick answers. Let's see how we how far we can get. So, how long does it take to typically uh, complete taps uh, during uh, an encounter? That, that's going to vary based on how many substances a patient is using. Um, so if a patient's just using one substance, it, you can complete it in a minute or two. If in that question that asks, if, are you using methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, et cetera, if they answer multiple substances, it's going to take longer because each of those questions are going to have a series of follow-up questions. So I not more than five to 10 minutes, even in the most expanded capacity, but I would say if you're, it's a good thing to be able to do once a year if you can, if you're tight on time and the patient answers, yes, they're using some substances and they can highlight for you specifically what substances they're using, you could go straight to the DSM-5 criteria as well. Great, thank you. Here's a very specific question about a guy who um, had an opioid use disorder with heroin. He's been clean for uh, several weeks or quite a while, but he wants to go on buprenorphine uh, to prevent relapse, help him prevent relapse. And he's been on it before and his dose before was eight milligrams twice a day. The question is, is it relatively safe to just go ahead and start his prior dose or should you ramp up to it um, uh, if he's off his heroin for, for a while? Is that okay just to go right to the eight twice a day because he's had that before? Yeah, that's a great question. And, it, and it's a really important scenario to think about because um, a lot of patients go into programs or have a period of abstinence without medication, but then desire medication. And that's a totally reasonable time to start. Um, in those patients, though, who have had a period of abstinence, they are now opioid naive. So they may not be as tolerant of the, the dose that they had previously used. Um, I see this a lot because I have a clinic in jail. And so um, what I generally do for those people is start them low, like two, four milligrams, and have them kind of titrate up as they're comfortable up to, and ultimately they can get to that prior dose, which is usually my goal, but um, but I start on the lower end just because they may not have the same tolerance that they had when they were previously treated. So it sounds like counseling uh, with that individual patient saying, hey, let me explain this because you, when you're on active uh, heroin use, uh, your tolerance is higher. So we probably need to start low rather than just going right exactly. back. Exactly. Even when they had been, if they had chronically been on buprenorphine in the past, if they've been off of it for several months, they they have lost some of that tolerance. Yeah, sounds, sounds a very important point. Um, so for someone who's on fentanyl, do you see in general a requirement for higher doses of buprenorphine, say 24 to 32 milligrams daily? Does it matter which opioid they've been using? Yeah, I do. So uh, my practice is in D.C. and Maryland, and um, in in these regions, it's almost exclusively fentanyl at this point. We are not seeing any um, heroin anymore. 
And, and the reality is that most of my patients do require 24 to 32 milligrams in order to, um, in order to kind of be well controlled. And so I think that is something that you want to take into consideration when you're starting people as if, if they're taking oxy tabs, um, they may, I mean, depending on how many, but they may not need as high of a dose, but with people who are on fentanyl, it does seem like they need much higher doses. There's just a very interesting, um, webinar or kind of, uh, about with SAMHSA yesterday, uh, exploring the concept of, um, getting rid of some of these, um, upper limit restrictions, um, because so many people are finding that they do need to go higher in fentanyl. So I, I am very comfortable going up to 32 milligrams. Um, that's usually kind of the maximum of what I can get through insurance. Okay. Got it. Dr. Mazur, do you have any, uh, uh questions? Uh, Alon, what's your retention rate of your patients do you start on uh, the Boxdown Clinic? Um, I it's seventy to eighty percent um at a year, so it 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 waxes and wanes a little bit. Um, as you imagine, these people go in and out of um incarcerated settings, and so we often lose them that way. But what I found is that for I mean, we obviously I treat HIV, Hep C, other infectious diseases, and other things, but for people that we treat. Um, with buprenorphine, they tend to come back into care, even if they fall out. Um, the, my biggest reason for loss is is overdose, unfortunately. And Mike, I, I could ask one other question. I, I know Alana has an interest in inpatients, and I know most of the people were talking to her outpatients, but uh, you've uh, uh, been very, um, uh, uh, you've done studies on patients or inpatients. The question is, are we missing opportunities when patients are admitted for complications of their intravenous drug use in terms of getting them uh, introduced to medical assisted therapy and getting them on this uh, as they transition out patients? Do you want to say something about that? Uh, yeah, I would say across the healthcare continuum, we're missing opportunities to initiate medication for opioid use disorder. The most recent data indicate that only one out of four people who had an opioid use disorder last year had any medication for opioid use disorder, which really reinforces why it's so critical that all providers are providing access. In the inpatient setting, when patients are hospitalized with infections, complications of injecting opioids, um, really fewer than one in four patients, kind of similar to the outpatient setting, are, um, are being initiated on medication for opioid use disorder. So I think, the, as we know, these patients can be pretty transient when they're coming in and out of healthcare. And so if you have an opportunity to engage with someone who's actively using opioids, don't waste it. Um, we know these patients are, you know, they can die so quickly, especially with fentanyl in the supply. And so we may only have one chance to, to get them into care. It's very important. Uh, we got about seven and a half minutes left. Let's see we, how many more we can questions we can get to. So can lozenge or candy be used to mask the bad taste? Um, it's really not recommended to use anything to be like sucking on anything while you're um, absorbing the buprenorphine, unfortunately, because the lozenge, you're swallowing the secretions and you want to absorb. Um, if for patients who really can't tolerate the taste, um, you could try Zubsolve, um, which has a minty flavor. So some people prefer that, um, but but hopefully over time there's kind of becomes like Pavlovian connection between like getting the benefit of Suboxone and the bad taste. But um, but yeah, if if people can't tolerate it, then I I try to offer Zubsolve and see if that's better. Um, there's a question here about the half life of the drug is 24 to 48 hours. So if somebody's at steady state, uh, it seems like the urine drug screen might be positive for longer than the twenty, the forty-eight hours that you mentioned. Um, how how does that work out? It's you know it's it's always hard to pin down, and I've talked to Lucor many times, and and depending on who you ask it, and how they metabolize, it can be somewhere between generally one to two, even up to three days, where you can get a urine beep that's positive. I think at the end of the day, the challenge is that, you know, we can't police our patients. And so, you you know, you have to be able to kind of trust 
what they say at using the urine drug screen as validation of it as well. And so if someone's telling me they're taking bup, there's bup and norbup in the urine, I don't worry that much if it could have been a day or two ago that, that they took it. And Lila Hagson is, is talking about uh, experience that they've had using microdose inductions when people are, uh, they want to use the bup immediately while waiting for the fentanyl or methadone to clear. Uh, have you had any experience with that or do you recommend that at all? Yes, um, it it is. It has become more challenging over the past several years with fentanyl to figure out the white, right ways to get people on medication. And I think um, across the country, there's been varying success and experience with um, some people having more precipitated withdrawal with fentanyl, even when people are off for several hours. And so there are um, protocols that you can access for microdosing, which some people have had success with um, to help people kind of titrate up slowly while continuing to use um, fentanyl or, or methadone as well. Um, I think that those are great strategies if you have capacity and you have patients who are able to kind of work with you on that. Yeah, I think the nature of these questions show that we have a very sophisticated audience as usual. Uh, one question about uh, point of care urine drug screens, uh, do they typically detect uh, fentanyl and benzos? It, you can get a urine, uh, point of care urine drug screens that detect um, fentanyl and benzos. Um, I don't think I'm aware of, though there may be um, your point of care urine drug screens. I don't know if they detect Norbuk. That, in my experience, I've had um, point of care cups that do bup and fentanyl ex and benzos, et cetera, but not Norbup. But I, there, it may be out there somewhere. Well, I guess it'll probably be produced at some point if it doesn't exist now. So um, another question about timing of antiretroviral therapy and the MAT. In other words, uh, do you give it the same time or roughly, or do you separate uh, by a couple hours? How do you approach that? Uh, it, it shouldn't matter. You can really do whenever. <laughs> if they remember to take it, they should take it then. That's usually my advice. That's really important. Um, is there still a specific uh, required training for buprenorphine? In other words, we don't need the waiver. With the waiver, um, uh, in other words, they can go on and just start using. The training will be required for the DEA relicense, but not for just general prescription. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. So there now the DA has just bulked in these required hours for anyone with a DA that hopefully will now be included in, in residency programs, but um, you should be able to prescribe. The, the one caveat I would say is that some pharmacies seem to have not updated their system. So when they're processing buprenorphine, sometimes they do still ask for the X number. Um, so you just have to remind them it's it's not necessary. Yeah. Um, yeah. The X number is now X. Exactly. Um, and so if um, a lot of points made by folks who are commenting about a lot of folks who have uh, opioid use disorder are also using methamphetamine. Do you have any general approach to how to manage? Um, you know, I've got somebody on bup, they've been successful. Um, how do you approach the meth or stimulant uh, activity? That is a really challenging question, and I would recommend you go to the webinar um, next week uh, that ISUSA is putting on. Um, we are grappling with that. I think, um, first and foremost, harm reduction, like I discussed, if they're injecting, um, if they're engaging in, in chemsex or um, party and play, then you know talking about HIV prevention, or if they already have HIV, obviously, um, making sure they're virally suppressed. Um, we, you know, there was a New England Journal article that had shown some benefit from naltrexone bupropion. So we've done that in some patients and I, and um, contingency management has been well studied, but hard to implement in the real world. Um, I think the area that there's increasing interest is using long acting stimulants as agonist therapy. I think that's, that's still under debate, but I know there are some providers in our area who are doing that. Um, and I'm curious to see what the webinar says about that next week. But um, I think we can all agree that methamphetamine use is a huge challenge. Um, and we don't we don't have the answers or the evidence right now to appropriately address it, unfortunately. Or I don't, at least. So uh, we have about a minute left. Uh, any precautions to think about if somebody's on a medication for opioid use disorder 
and then you have to administer naloxone. Is there things to be aware of or concerned about? Are you, I guess, if you're administering naloxone, it's generally because they're overdosed. And so that right. usually is the priority. Um, naloxone is going to wear off before the methadone or buprenorphine wears off. And right. so um, they they should, you know, kind of regain the, the benefit from that after like 30 minutes or an hour, I think. Um, yeah, I think yeah. I think it's, it is a challenge. And, and a lot of times people get naloxone and want to use again immediately. But um, it's well, just. Yeah. yeah. So basically you you use the naloxone when you have to and, uh, yeah. and manage them. So uh, Vic mentions that naloxone in Chicago is available free at public libraries, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and I think that's all we have time for questions. Those of you who we didn't get to your question live on this. Uh, the Q and A period, um, uh, Dr. Rosenthal can go through and answer them uh, with the typed response. But thank you very much. I know there's virtual applause everywhere for what you've uh, just presented. A fantastic job and uh, for the presentation and for the Q and A. So thank, thank you so much, Alana. Well done.